purposes of a joint address uh, by William Walker, Governor of the State of Alaska. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. President. I move and ask unanimous consent that the roll call of the Senate be waived and that all members be shown as present. Without objection, the roll call is waived and all members are shown as present. Uh, Mr. Majority Leader of the House. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, I move and ask unanimous consent that the roll call of the House be waived and that all members of the House be shown as present. So moved. Will Senator Von Emhoff and Representative Jonathan Christ Tompkins please escort Governor Walker to the podium. President Kelly, Speaker Edgman, Lieutenant Governor Malott, members of the legislature, members of the cabinet, and my fellow Alaskans, good evening and thank you for this opportunity to address the second regular session of the 30th legislature and speak directly to the people of Alaska. Lieutenant Governor Malott, over the last three years, you have been so much more than a lieutenant governor. You've been a friend, a brother, a shoulder to the wheel, your fierce devotion to the state where we were both born inspires me every day. To my first lady of 40 years, Donna, and to Byron's first lady of 45 years, Tony, thank you both for all you do for the people of Alaska. Byron and I could not do our jobs without you. I also want to acknowledge our daughter Tessa, and son-in-law Dennis, as well as Joey Malott, and all the Walker and Malott family members tuning in. Thank you all for your daily support and encouragement. <clears throat> to my cabinet and staff, your diversity of thought, experience, and background have collectively formed the backbone of this administration. I am proud of you and grateful for your dedicated service. <laughs> to our military men and women and first responders who run toward danger, to protect and defend others, you are our everyday heroes. And to the families of the three young Alaskans, Private First Class Hanson Kirkpatrick, Chief Warrant Officer Jacob Sims, and Staff Sergeant David Brabender, who lost their lives last year while in combat and in support of combat operations. We extend our deepest sympathies and gratitude.
A debt of gratitude is also owed to our 70,000 Alaskan veterans. Thank you all for your sacrifice, your service, and your selfless dedication to this state and this nation. And finally, to my fellow Alaskans watching or listening all over the state, being informed is critical to being part of the solution. Thank you for your engagement tonight. I don't have to tell you how richly blessed we are to be Alaskans, to live in a land of unparalleled beauty with limitless potential. Of course, we have some challenges, some more difficult than others, but my optimism this evening comes directly from the state of our state, from the strength and resilience of our people, and from the steps we are taking to control our own destiny by building a safer, smarter, stronger Alaska. I'd like to start by sharing a story from the past year. Last October, Byron and I sat with Chris Apasigak, a 17-year-old from Gamble, as he delivered his keynote speech to the Elders and Youth Conference. Chris told us about a simple Facebook post about a successful bowhead whale hunt that provoked a thunderstorm of threats and hateful messages from outside Alaska. This wasn't the first time that Chris had faced challenges. He told us about one hunt when the clamps on the boat motor broke and he helped keep the motor in place by gripping the steering shaft in his hands for 100 miles for the ride home. He told us about running aground during a hunt and having to camp out in the cold for two nights until search and rescue could arrive from Savunga. I was inspired by Chris's story. You know, while some 17-year-olds might be feeding their egos, Chris was feeding his village. One reporter tweeted that Alaska is a great place because the governor will hold the mic of a teenager in a polar bear hat for 20 minutes so he can talk about what's going on with whale hunting. Chris had plenty of opportunities to give up or get discouraged. But instead, he is standing tall as a leader for his people. To that I say, Alaska is a great place because we are home to people like Chris. People who persevere. <laughs> people who persevere and triumph in the face of adversity. And if this young man can land a bowhead, survive the wilderness, hold a boat motor together for a 100 mile journey, the least I can do is hold his mic so the world can hear his story. At best, Alaskans are tough, resourceful, and independent. We harvest king crab in the Bering Sea in mid-January. We run dog teams a thousand miles to Nome. We come back from hunting and share our moose meat with our elders. We take pride in not doing things the way they do them in the lower 48. Some refer to Alaskans as Imagineers. We don't have a 1-800 number for every problem. We are Alaskans, and we figured it out. At some of the most pivotal moments in our history, our rugged independence has carried the day. We fought tooth and nail to become a state and to make sure the trans alaska oil pipeline was built, transforming our economy. Alaskan leaders like Nick Begich, Ted Stevens, and Emil Nadi worked for years alongside AFN to develop the groundbreaking Alaska Native Claim Settlement Act and our ANCSA corporations. Too often, however, we have played a passive role. In the past, we have accepted the idea that tough negotiating is bad for resource development. We have assumed that addressing the reality of climate change would somehow be incompatible with building major infrastructure and improving our quality of life. We have conceded that our politics at home should look just like the dysfunctional partisanship we see in Washington, D.C. Byron and I ran for office because we believed this antiquated system sets us up for failure. Sure, it works fine when there's plenty of money to spread around, 
But when you don't make tough decisions to plan for the future, you leave the destiny up to chance. That's exactly what we saw when the price of oil crashed to $26. A barrel at the end of 2014. Fortunately, we meet Alaskans who are making tough decisions and taking control of their future. In Valdez, the total men suffered a devastating fire in late 2016. Some suggested that the owners, Mike Williams and his sister, Connie Ballou, should just take the insurance money and call it a day. Mike and Connie had a different plan. I saw Mike the day he signed a new construction loan, and with a deep emotion, he told me, Bill, I believe in Valdez. I believe in Alaska. Not only are we going to rebuild, we're going to rebuild with all Alaskan materials, Alaskan contractors, and Alaskan labor. The new Totem Inn is on track to open in time for tourist season this year. From new breweries in Girdwood and Talkeetna, to energy and small business startups, to large companies making significant new investments on the North Slope, Alaskans are committed to this state. They are making tough decisions and fighting for their future. They deserve leaders who are willing to do the same. Alaskans, we are turning a page in history as we move into position to control our destiny. Let me describe what controlling our destiny looks like. When Alaska became a state, the Alaska Statehood Compact established the conditions for our entry. <coughs> Alaska was granted 103 million acres of public land and became the only state in America with exclusive ownership of the resources in the ground. The message from Washington, D.C. to the new state was clear. Alaska was to develop our mineral resources in order to establish a viable economy and support the cost of self-government. Therefore, controlling our destiny requires taking aggressive measures to access and develop those resources responsibly. It means pursuing innovative measures to fill up the oil pipeline. The model today is for the state to provide the infrastructure to develop our resources. This is the customary role of government. We make nothing on oil discovered but left in the ground. Access and production are key. We are now working to develop toll roads so exploration can take place 12 months a year rather than just in the winter months. We applaud the recent production activities which have resulted in two consecutive years of increased oil throughput in the pipeline. We also welcome all the new players out in the field working hard to increase production. This year, we saw the highest dollar bids on North Slope lease sales in over 20 years. We also applaud the successful efforts of our congressional delegation to secure access for responsible exploration in the land set aside decades ago for development, the 1002 slice of Anwar. <laughs> However, even with all this welcomed activity, oil alone is no longer the sole answer. We must diversify our portfolio. <clears throat> 